Hey everyone, thanks for joining me for another top 10. Yes, two in a row to make up for the fact that I didn't have the, like, it was a while before the last one. And uh, you've already seen top 10 games with a high replay value, I hope. You know, I look forward to reading your comments on that one. But this is my top 10 multiplayer games that I think are best with two players. So what exactly do I mean by that? Well, most of the time, when, when players, sorry, when publishers put two to five players, two to six players, two to four players on a box. A lot of the time, the only reason they put two players on there is to sell more copies. Ah, cash grab! <laughs> it usually ends up being that way. And certainly, as soon as they put five on the box, it pretty much is always to sell more copies. Yeah, there are some games that work well with five to six, but that is a rarity compared to a lot of games where they go, well, it doesn't really work with five, it's a bit too long, but fine, just stick five on the box, it will sell more copies. Or the two-player is some hideous variant with like an extra page of rules, some dummy bot, or something lame, you know, I mean, Seven Wonders had a two-player version, that was, you know, not Seven Wonders Duel, that's excellent, but the original Seven Wonders, it had a two-player bot variant in it, rubbish. And other games just keep doing this as well. It's just throw in a bot, throw in a bot, throw in a dummy mechanic of some description. It'll work with two players. No, it doesn't. Stop it. Make your game say three to four players on the box. I don't care if it makes you lose a little bit of extra cash. It's misleading and I don't like it. Everybody got that? But... In the opposite sense, with multiplayer games that do work with two, there are a few out there that actually work best at two. Where I'm like, you know what? Two player is where it's at. This is the perfect blend of the game, you know, for rules, mechanics, time, length, ease of play, that kind of thing. And adding more players is just adding more time or unnecessary complication or it unbalances the game in some way. And there was quite a few to pick from and it was hard to rank my actual shortlist but I've got 10 games here and I look forward to hearing what your 10 games are as well. So by all means, once you're done listening to this video, feel free to put your suggestions in the comments below so that other people can read them as well. After all, it's not just my 10 games I want to get across here. I want to get across your guys' choices, your guys and girls' choices as well. Eh, trying to say the right things. So without further ado, come on. My first one, I was going to blend two games together until I realized that the one of the two I prefer to play, I'm actually okay with playing with more than two players. It actually works reasonably well regardless, even though I do like it at two. So rather than put San Juan in this mix as well, I'm gonna nudge that out to the side and instead put Race for the Galaxy here. This is not a game that's my favorite, hence I'm sort of squeaking in at number 10, but I think, the, the viewers would basically, well, they'd have my head if I didn't put this on the list. But it can be played with two, three, or four players, and it's the symbol card game. Well, I say symbol, the mechanics are symbol, the iconography and the actual how to win the rotten game is uh, somewhat hard. But I am not very good at it. But with this one is that you select a card to say what action you're going to do in the round and everybody gets to do that action. So you're thinking about the opponent saying, well, I need to settle, but do you think the opponent's going to settle? In which case I could do something else and let them do the settle one for me. But maybe I want the bonus, I don't know. And this in a two player game is fantastic. This is the only way I want to play Race for the Galaxy because with that, you've got only the two actions going off and sometimes the round will only have the one action if you duplicate. And so so you are really intently trying to think, oh, but will they go for that action? Will they go for it? I don't know. As soon as you play this with four players, and even three to some extent, you might as well just shuffle up your phase cards and deal one out because chances are your phase is going to get played. You might duplicate with one player, but then a lot of the times you'll be like, I really want to settle this round. Well, one of those three looks like they're going to settle. Fine, I'll just do explore. And it just completely removes the fun of the game for me. So it's not a game that I come to very often, but I will play it if people suggest it on the table, even though I know I'm going to lose because I suck at it. But yeah, I only want to play this with two players, ideally. Even if it's like, come on, you're going to cream me? Fine, but let's get a nice, you know, nice and quick. I mean, that's the thing. The, the game is super fast with two players. But I want that tension of getting into the one opponent's head, not three, at the same time. You know, where it might as well just be guesswork at that point. So, number 10, it's squeaking on, but and with San Juan, I feel that I'm actually happy to play it with three or four players. It works fine at two as well. So, I would give this one solely to Race for the Galaxy. 
From number nine, I have to turn to a family game over in that yonder direction. This is one of the most popular family games I have taught at Dice Portsmouth events or even just to people in general. You know, uh, uh, did I teach it to my ex-girlfriend? I don't know, but you know, I have taught it to loads of people who have never heard of games before and they've really loved it. They've taken to it. Baron Park is a brilliant polyomino style laying game. I, it, I would dare say it's probably my favorite one of the lot. It can be played two, three, or four players, and it works fine at all those counts, but I would say it works best with two, because of two reasons. Firstly, it's a lot quicker, because the extra players, it's pretty much multiplayer solitaire, apart from taking a tile you might want off the central board. Other than that, the park tiles scale with players, and so do all the rest of the tiles, so it's not like the extra third and fourth player really adds much, apart from just more time to wait for people to think. But, here's a little twist with the two-player version. With the third and fourth player, you have so many tiles on the board, and I think with, with four players, they go seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. You're essentially laying polyomino Tetris tiles on the grid, and it's a first-come, first-served for the most points. The sooner you take a tile, the more points it's worth. So, in four-player, it goes seven, six, five, two, three, two, one. In a free player, I think it goes six, five, four, three, two. You know, it goes in that sort of order. With a two-player game, I believe it instead goes six, four, two, or five, three, one. It goes, it goes two points every step. Now, even though there's only two of you taking tiles, the tension of taking the tile first is ratcheted up to another level because you're not just when somebody takes the tile in a three or four-player game, it's like. Well, they took one, I mean, it's one point, no big deal. But suddenly two points is a bit more of a, like, oh, I know, and a, they might want the panda tile. That's going to be a whole two points I lose. Do I even want the tile after that? It does rack it up the tension a bit more. So you save a bit of time, and the choosing of the bear house tiles is already, like, an extra bit of tension added to that. So, with my opinion, I think Baron Park has always been a best at two, even though I will play it with more players, hence I'm sort of keeping it at number nine on this list. But, you know, I'd be interested to know whether you agree with that or whether you believe it actually deserves more players. But apart from adding extra time, I don't see what the extra players really add. Yes! So that's my number nine, Baron Park. My number eight is probably my favorite deck builder that exists. And yeah, I'd, I'd say that's probably quite true. This is a deck builder which not only grants you multi-use cards, which I love, I love that mechanic. You know, do you want to buy cards? Do you want to use them for their cool abilities? Or do you want to entomb them? Does that ring a bell to some people? Well, should do with Valley of the Kings, which is a brilliant deck builder. You've got the pyramid of cards that crumbles as you take cards from the base and it refreshes with more cards, but you're collecting sets and each set has unique cards with all these cool special abilities themed to particular certain types, like one set might be about forcing your opponent to discard cards a lot, one might be very good at searching the boneyard for stuff, It's and one might be very good for entombing cards. But it's that wonderful mechanic of having to decide, right, well, I need to entomb cards, otherwise I won't score any points for them, but uh, when do I start entombing? Do I start early or do I hope I can do it later? How long do I leave it before the momentum gets going to such an extent that it's like, uh oh, I haven't left myself enough time to entomb, I gotta think of something. It's a really cool deck builder. With two players though, the abilities scale fine with two players, but a lot of this comes down to just sheer time. If this new version, the Valley of the Kings one, goes up to six players. I don't know what form of quaaludes you have to be on in order to consider this as a six player game. Because even the base version, like the normal little one, I think I've still got it somewhere, although I'm not sure where I've put it, but you know, the small one went up to four players. I didn't want to play this with three, let alone four. You know, I was playing it either solo or as a two player primarily, but I will settle for free. But all you're doing is adding more time. That's it. And the pyramid doesn't get any bigger. It's still one, two, three, four, five, six cards. Six cards in that pyramid. So if there's four of you, chances are the pyramid has changed so dramatically by the time it gets back round to you, you might as well just you know, zone off for a turn after you've figured out, oh, well, I know which abilities I'm not using. Oh, well, cool. Let's see what the pyramid's got by the time it gets round to me. It's like, that just ruins it. Five and six players would just be ridiculous. I mean, why? 
Why, A.G.? Why? <laughs> that makes no sense. But your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. That's a small gripe. I mean, the premium edition has still got the funky tarot-sized cards and the sleeves and that, so, you know, it's a minor quibble. And the player powers, which are pretty sweet. But two-player, nice and quick. The game goes at a pretty good pace, you know, the, before you know it, you're already on the level, like, the second level cards, and it's like, I better get going, I better hurry up and entomb stuff. And with the certain abilities, you know, just forcing your one opponent to discard a card, but still the same as forcing three opponents to discard cards. At the end of the day, it's hurting your opponent. So for speed and complexity, because... The fact that you've got all these different abilities means that there's going to be the slow player who just drags the game out like crazy, and if you're playing with one of those, it ain't anywhere near as bad as playing with three of them. Or five of them. It was 80, what? Uh, I don't know. Oh well, it's... No, I don't forget this. AG, what the hell you... My number seven is a darling little treasure in the abstract game family. I mean, this one came out uh, about a year or two ago, I believe, and it took the gaming world by storm. This gateway level abstract game about laying mosaic tiles that has now become the biggest cash grab I've seen in my life. It's like, if I cry out loud, <laughs> it's like, I was happy with the original version. I hated the one that came after it, and I sort of like the one that came next, but it's like, I am done with Azul, getting reprinted in all these different fashions where literally all you do is change the scoring mechanism. Come on, the original one was fine. And the original one definitely plays best at two players. Because with three and four, you've got, it scales with the mosaic tile. So it's not to do with, oh, the board state has changed dramatically. No, what makes this one best at two is A, speed, because you don't have to wait for multiple people to take turns, especially with the later ones. But with the, with the Zool in general, there's this whole aspect of trying to force the taking of the tiles in such a way that your opponent has to take tiles they cannot take and in doing so they drop them all on the floor they break and they lose negative points in a two-player game it is a lot easier and a lot more like ow like painful to do that to your opponent because you've only got to focus on what they have and when you look at the tiles you've only got to go Back, forth, back, forth. Yep, you're taking those red tiles. If I take those blue ones here, haha, <laughs> fun with that. And that is just so much better than trying to do it with four players because the only way it works like that in a four player game is if each person does it to the person to their left. I guarantee you that doesn't happen. People will do their own thing or not care, especially new players. They don't know about the whole back and forth screwage system. It's like they're new to the game. And so with three and four, it just feels a little bit too chaotic. And if you do get screwed over by the tiles, just a bit more random than I would like. Two player though, you are actively thinking like halfway through the round thinking, I can really screw you over if I take those tiles first. And even then, if you're looking at their board, you've only got to see, what, five rows in order to gauge what tiles they need. You're not trying to look at three different players. You can't stop everyone by yourself, but you can stop that one player. And in a two player game, you're the only one who's gonna do it. So yeah, might as well do it. It just easily, I think, just works quicker, faster, and there's definitely more tension and screwage potential with two players. And I don't think I'm alone on this one. I think the majority of people out there agree that it's best that too. But like I say, I'll still play it with three and four, but I just think you're losing a little bit of an edge if you don't keep it at two. My number six is a very small little filler game. In fact, it's a very recent one. I think I reviewed it back in early January or is it late December I believe I reviewed this one. Small little card game from Bombix, sequel to one of my top 10 games of all time and it's just this nice little chum here, Abyss Conspiracy. We have a rubber band because I decided to sleeve the cards. Whoops, but oh well, needs must. But this little card game besides being just really amazing is also definitely best at two players. Although I will play it with three and four. With Abyss Conspiracy, you have, you're building another pyramid of cards Am I noticing pyramids becoming a trend lately? But you build an upside down pyramid of these Lord cards, great artwork, all the different colors, and you're trying to get Lords of varying points, abilities, and color groupings, you know, based on a, I ch was it? Based on a, how much, well, I don't know what the mechanic would be. Uh, 
It's, it's a mechanic where you get to look at a certain number of cards. That's your choice, but what you don't take has to go face up for other players to see. I don't recall exactly what the term for that is, but let's say I want to look for a particular lord and I go, I'll look at three cards, okay? I'll look at three cards. All right, that lord I'll keep. The other two have to go face up for the other players to take. And if there's multiple in a stack of the same color, they can take the whole stack and that can be pretty powerful if you let them have too much. So it's that thing of, I want to have the flexibility and the choice, but then in doing so, I'm giving the opponents the flexibility and the choice. Now with a three and four player game of this, it, the stacks kind of empty themselves pretty quickly. They don't get particularly high before somebody nicks the stack. And you know, you can end up just by fluky bad turn order to get into state where I have no choice but to look at cards because all the stacks have been taken by two other players who have decided to do it. We have a two player game though, two things happen. Firstly, that whole back and forth thing, you know, with your opponent is ratcheted up to 11. In fact, three things, that's one of them. The second thing is that with your, when you're thinking about only one opponent, it doesn't feel quite as ridiculously painful at looking at multiple cards then. Because in a four player game, if you look at three cards all the time, you're basically just giving your opponents all, all, everything they need. But when the two player, you can kind of gamble a bit more. Also with that, the stacks, there's only so many stacks. So you might take a, a bunch of cards and then a bunch of them go out. They might take a stack, but then there could be a stack there that they like. Sorry, that you like. And so that tension goes back and forth with like, oh, I really want to take that stack, but if I leave them that stack, that's gonna get them quite a bit as well. And the same goes for locations. On top of that, two player game is just super, super fast. I wish I could remember his name, but the uh, French uh, demo guy at Essen who taught me this game and maybe like, right, I wanna buy this, taught me the rules and we played the game in 20 minutes. You know, and there's not like, I mean, it's not the hardest game ever, but there's a few rules to get across. And, you know, he's speaking a second language effectively. You know, he's predominantly French and then trying to speak English to me. And 20 minutes and we got it done. And it was just super fast back and forth with the pearl thing as well. Like, I've got two pearls now. You've got three pearls. Ah, I've got two more. Give it back here. It's like, you know, it worked so well. So I got to say, fantastic little card game. If you want to know more about it, then check out my review video on it. But I would also say that if you're trying to find a small filler game for two of you, look at this one as something new and something fresh, and I think you'll get a kick out of this one. My number five is from the great Bruno Cafala, one of my favorite designers. This game is probably the heaviest game I've seen Days of Wonder ever put out. And it will burn your brain when you see it, but it's very nice and colorful on the table. I'll give it that, even though it has a bit of a setup chore. And that is five tribes, which ironically I'm saying play with two and it doesn't technically have more than five tribes. It's, it's like it has more than five tribes now with the expansion. I, mean, I think the name's kind of gone the pot at this point. But the normal game of five tribes has you doing a Mancala mechanic. So you pick up a bunch of color meeples and then go drop one, drop another, drop another, and then whatever color you drop last triggers all the same color meeples on that tile and you perform a special function. You know, grab cards from a set, assassinate another meeple, get these uh, genie cards, which are really cool, and all the different colors do this. Now, this is a an area of tiles filled to the brim with these color meeples. It is a, whoa, it burns your brain to look at it and try and deduce the best move. With four, three or four of you in the game, it's very chaotic. I mean, that board state can change so dramatically by the time it gets back around to you. It's very difficult to come up with two or three different options before it's your turn. And certainly with new players, it can drag the game out like crazy. Two players though, not only do you shave the time down, you also have the chance to go, that's a really good move there, but I need to do this and hopefully, Hopefully he's not spotted that move, he's not spotted that move. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Yay, I got it, it's just mine. And you've only got to worry about the one person seeing the move and you can't do everything. But the added bonus is that in a two player version of this, you have two of the, the counters, the tokens, to dictate turn order. Normally you only bid with one, but in a two player game you get two each. So you can actually set yourself up, if you bid right, for double turns. And that adds a new strategic layer to the game, because otherwise it was just, I get the one turn and that's it. But you might see two fantastic moves out there, or one move that directly leads on from another move you've got planned. 
But if you bid high enough, you can have your two turns in a row and do that particular function. And even if it's just back, forth, back, forth, it's still, you know, will I get my second action before they get theirs? You might say, I just want to go last twice. You do your two moves first and I'll see what's left. It just adds that extra element to the game that I think elevates it above a three and four player mode. And that's before you get to the obvious, it takes less time, which is no bad thing <laughs> to have this game take less time because it can drag like crazy with AP players, which is understandable. It is a very AP inducing game, but with two players, Ironically, two players with five tribes, <laughs> the numbers all over the shop now, I think works best for this one. So my number four is within nice shot, so I'll see if you can figure this one out. You have, you're in a magic tournament. You've got three years, and during these three years, you are playing these cards that score you points in the kind of engine building kind of way. You collect manner of all these different elements, and in particular seasons <laughs> throughout the year, yeah, I can't really keep it much longer, you get to roll these big chunky dice of different colors that allow you to get certain types of mana easier than others, and you won't necessarily use all the dice in the game. Whichever die you leave behind accelerates the timer around the board, and essentially you're doing a kind of Magic the Gathering style type of game where it's playing these cards with cool abilities with the mana cost and trying to score more points than the opponent. Now, with three and four players, three's not too bad, but four just, I think, takes a little bit too long. Not to mention the timer could be all over the shop by the time it's your turn, and some of the effects on some of the abilities on those cards are a little bit too powerful with four people. I mean, there are some that leech points off the opponents. If it's only got to leech off one player, it's considerably more balanced than when it leeches off three other players. It's, you know, yes, it may cost a little bit extra to put out, but it doesn't offset the benefit that having more players gets you for stuff like that. Two players, though, it's a really quick game. I mean, you can get a game of seasons done in an hour with two players. That's pretty fast for how involved the game is. And... You know, the, the timer is easier to gauge because you're thinking there's a good chance that you might take it past the spring season, but I reckon we'll be in spring next turn. So if I plan for that, we're in good stead, you know, it, and even then the abilities on the cards, I feel are more balanced with two players and it just takes that complexity level down the notch where you haven't got to think about three players worth of effects that could be going off and doing stuff. It just... It elongates the game a little bit just by sheer complexity of the abilities that are out there, particularly when you start throwing in expansions and getting in all sorts of cool abilities. But two players, one hour, nice and quick, easy to gauge the board. You know, you've still got those chunky dice. Willpower, Luke. Willpower. Willpower. <laughs> yeah. Last time I couldn't resist throwing those dice. They're so addictive, those dice. I'm going to resist this time. You're going to be a man, Luke. You're going to... You're going to... Oh, screw this. Season's my number four. It's a great game. 20 minutes later. In a way, I feel slightly disturbed by those turn of events. Oh well, never mind. On with number three. And that is a huge, like, sprawling civilization game. Well, I say huge, it's mostly cards, but it's huge in the sense that it takes forever to play. Like, ridiculously forever to play. I will not play this game with more than two players in real life, the end. Yeah, it's not gonna happen. And even on the app version of this, I will usually keep it at two players, even if I'm just playing against an AI, because I just won't want the extra time and complexity that is added when through the ages throws in that third and fourth player. This is a civilization game that can take like three hours with two players. Do you really think I want to take this past the four to five hour mark with three and four players? No, of course I don't. And yeah, there'll be some people out there that are like, well, we can finish this in 90 minutes with four of us because we're super fast and on our ivory tower. Yeah, whatever. For most people, this is a game that takes forever to finish with two players, let alone three, and certainly let alone four. It's just not a game I ever want to touch with three or four players. Now, granted, the caveat with this one is that I do pretty much play this game solely on the app. You know, because the app has kind of killed the physical game, really, for me. It's like, you've got this sprawling big game with the setup and the bookkeeping, or you could just play the app, which is fantastic. You know, absolutely brilliant stellar app. One of, if not the best one out there. But even on the app, I'm like, how many AI opponents do I want? I just want to deal with one. Just one person, have a war with that person, do the insurgency and that. When you've got multiple players... 
I just don't feel it adds a lot to the game to have multiple players. You've got, what, a few cards that say, oh, well, you can make a pact with this player. Well, you could make a pact with the one player. Why do I need two more players to be there? It just feels like they don't contribute enough to the game to warrant the massive extra time that this delivers when you have that many players. So, mostly for time, but also I'd say for complexity's sake as well, just keep through the ages at two. Or play it solo on the app. Either way, keep it at two on the app. I'd rather not even play with free AI players. It's a really cool Civ game. Main reason I don't have it in the collection is because I pretty much play it on the app. But it took me a while to warm up to this game. I was a bit like, oh God, this is way too long. And this is really over convoluted and complex. Then they brought out the fourth edition version. The Czech game editions did the fourth edition version. Beautiful production. Streamlined it to a point where I was happy with it. I warmed up to the game. I now think it's really good. Still, I think, prefer Nations, which I think is in the other room somewhere. But, you know, I still love this game as well. But, yeah, 2 max. Definitely 2 max. My number 2 is two games. Yeah, slight cheap. But let's face it, they play very similarly. And in both cases, I say 2 max. You know, I love these games solo, i got to admit. But I'm not including solo as a caveat with the rules here. It's like, there may be games that I prefer to play solo, but that I'm talking about the multiplayer there. I'm talking about those who don't play solo. Because if I did that, then I don't think I'd have a list, to be honest, because there's a lot of games I might prefer to play solo, but that's my personal circumstances for living alone. So it doesn't quite relate to a lot of you guys out there. But for, for this one, I am choosing Imperial Settlers and Empires of the North. You know, I mean, pick your poison. Imperial Settlers, Empires of the North, whichever one you prefer, in my case, both. But with this one, yeah, adding more players really doesn't make a lot of difference. You know, you add the third and the fourth player, there's not a huge amount of extra interaction. You are doing your engine builder in front of you, and occasionally you might want to raise an opponent or, like, get to the shipping lane in Empires of the North's case, you know, before other players do, but that's really about it. And it's impossible to raise three extra players in Empires of the North if you're the only one doing it. You just won't make enough resources. Okay, you'll notice it's a little bit darker at the moment. One of the lights is... A couple of the batteries or one of the lights is playing up. I might need to replace it. But, oh uh, well, on with the show. Where was I? Oh yeah, Empires of the North and Imperial Settlers. One thing I'll say about the two-player game, definitely very, very quick. In fact, the first time I played this game was in the UK Games Expo last year, and I played it with Ignacity Trakovic himself. Have you ever played a Euro game with Ignacity? For people like me, who hate it when people take forever on their turns, Ignacity is like your dream opponent. I swear, he's Zippy Gonzalez. He is the Flash when he plays Euro game. These pieces are all very volatile. <laughs> How's this look? Okay, that's good. Barely takes any time to think, he just gets on with it. And it's not like he's making dumb moves all the time, it's like you got to keep your wits about you. But we played possibly the fastest two-player game of any Euro I've ever played, and certainly the fastest game of Empires of the North I've ever played. You know, and this is why we had Z Garcia next to us, you know, chatting to us as well, and it just went back and forth super fast. I picked the game up quickly, bear in mind I played Imperial Settlers a lot, so I kind of had some background knowledge. But, oh, it was a great game. And I won. Ah, smug mode. Well... <laughs> With three and four, it's fine, but it just drags the game out a little bit too long because you've got to wait for everybody to do all their actions, the round takes a while. With Empires of the North, you've got a variable endgame trigger, but with Imperial Settlers, you've got those, I think, five rounds, is it? That you've got to finish, regardless of how long the game's going. It's just... Yeah, I don't see the need to play this with three or four unless I can trust that people are doing their turns really quick. Solo, I do love. Both have got fantastic solo modes. But certainly, if there's just two of you and you're interested in one of these games, you can't go wrong. It will do really well for you at two. And finally, to wrap up my nighttime mode of doing this top ten, is a small little card game again that I have not played in so long. I really want to get it to the table again. I miss it so much. And one of the biggest problems I have is A, I can't play it solo, but B, I will quintessentially only want to play this with two players because it just becomes unbalanced with more players. The game gets ridiculously convoluted with more players. The game drags on lengthwise with more players. It's just not good to play innovation with more than two players. But at two players, 
it sings and becomes one of my favorite card games of all time. Uh, granted, I have the third edition version. I know that the second edition was the only one that looked good from an aesthetics point of view, but the graphic design on the third one is a bit easier to, to read. And yes, it looks like an abstracted card game. You're just playing cards and looking at symbols. But those abilities that go off the cards, the, the cooperative dogmas and the aggressive ones, it's so good to build up combos with those. And with two players, it is very much a back and forth game. You know, you have not got to watch out for chaos among the table, which happens definitely with four players. Even in team mode, it's a bit too chaotic. But with two of you, the board state is clear as day to see what's going on. I mean, the cooperative one, you've only got to think about, is it helping the one opponent as opposed to everybody around the table? And the aggressive one, well, you're hurting somebody, hopefully, so why not? The game goes at a nice pace, it doesn't take too long, doesn't take long to teach and set up because you've only got two people to worry about, and it just feels like a nice, balanced, thingy, tactical card game. I love this one, but I don't get to play it very often because I'm pretty much, like, adamant I will only play this with two players. I mean, you've got to convince me hard to play this with more players like everybody needs to know what they're doing everybody must have played this game before and we are not going to take forever with it maybe you could convince me then buy me a drink as well that helps but you know <laughs> wink wink nudge nudge but you know, oh, i love this one it's such a cool card game i hate the fact that i can't play it more often you know dream future girlfriend will like innovation and then we can play it together loads that would be amazing because then at least i can justify the fact that it's in my collection i don't want to get rid of it even though it's hard to play it because i know that when i do play it with the two players it is fantastic and it had to be my easy number one i think i thought of innovation as one of the first games that popped into my mind and then i had to think of the other nine it really was that crystal clear to me so yeah those are 10 Oh, I try to keep my uh, breath in check. 10 multiplayer games that I think are best with two players. I reckon that some of you out there will probably be able to come up with your entire own list of 10. In which case, put it in the comments. I want to see it. I want other people to see it as well. Do you agree with the ones on my list? Do you believe that they work best with more players instead of two? In which case, let me know your reasons why. Let's talk. I want to know more. So in terms of a Patreon choice, this one was a little bit harder to do because the two main Patreon choices that turned up were two I've already mentioned. You know, certainly Race for the Galaxy came up, but the most popular one was Azul. So, you know, a fair few people agree with me. There was one other though that is on my shortlist that I didn't mention. So I'm gonna give the credit to this one here, and that is Dominion. And to be fair, there's only so much I can really say about this one. Pretty much the same reason as Valley of the Kings and maybe the other some of the other games like Innovation. It's just super fast. Adding the extra player in Dominion really doesn't do much to the game in terms of interaction. And whoopee, your curse might affect another player. Does it really matter? But with two players, especially two players who know what they're doing in Dominion, oh my god, and we finished. Right, reset, go again. It's stupidly fast with two players. So I'm perfectly in agreement here. There's definitely the player count I like to play Dominion at, but I will play it with more if the chance arises, providing people are familiar with the game. But wow, yeah, the two-player mode is just lightning speed with two players who know how to play Dominion. So yeah, Perfectly happy to put this one on the Patreon choice. In terms of other ones that I did consider, well, what have we got? Splendor, I'll play it with two, three or four players. I wasn't too fussed. Uh, Underwater Cities, two players is very good. I did want to put this on the list, but then I thought, I don't particularly like playing it with four, but I do like playing it with three. Three adds another set, uh, a really good amount of tension and keeps the game going at a reasonable pace. So two and three are kind of on equal terms for me. Elysium was another one, the much underrated game from Matthew Dunstan. I've played it with more players. It scales with the cards, but the fact that you've got to wait for three people to make that agonizing choice of what card to take can drag the game out quite a bit, and chances are you're going to lose whatever card you're aiming for. Two players, though, it's very much a gamble. Like, will he take it? Will they take it? I'll take this one. I reckon I'm good for another turn. And it just works really well. Such an underrated game. Seriously, can we have a second edition of it, please? It really needs to come back into the limelight. Uh, Dice City? I consider Dice City down there. I mean, 
There's not a huge amount of point having extra players there, it's easier to attack the one person that is free more, and the game can drag on with multiple people, and not to mention it's a huge table hog, so Dice City would certainly be in my teens. Uh, Everdell? Yeah, works fine with two, three or four players, it just maybe adds a bit too much time. Although with more players, you've got more locations that you could go visit, so I didn't feel like it quite deserved a top 10 spot. Uh, Carcassonne? I do like it sometimes with more players because the map gets a little bit more built up, but then two players, it's a bit more of a tight-fisted game. Tomato, tomato, I didn't think it deserved the top 10 spot. Uh, Tigris and Euphrates and Yellow and Yanks. Two players is pretty strategic, but then so's four, so's three. I like it with two, but I didn't think it was like the best at two. For some reason, I wrote down the gallerist, although that might have been a bit of a dud because frankly, I want more chances to get kicked off my spot. Although, with two players, you do have to be a bit more, like, tactical as to whether you think the opponent's going to kick you off, whereas in four player, you're kind of getting kicked off all the time. But then I do like Gallerist at three players for that nice balance of the two. And the final one I had on here was Citadels, but I like Citadels at most player counts. So, you know, not six or more, but five or less. I like it at all the counts. But, yeah, Citadels has a really good two-player mode. I think I prefer it with three, compared to two, which is why I didn't feel like it deserved a spot. But yeah, two player in Citadels is really solid, where you've got two characters each and you've just got to think about that one opponent. It's a really cool factor to take in and, you know, it almost made my list, but eh, maybe it'd be closer to the 20s, I guess, you know, around that point. But who knows? There's a lot of games out there that I'm sure probably people could argue is best with two, but I'd be interested to know what you guys have to say. So, uh, that's it for me. If you like what you see, then please check out the Patreon. See if you want to subscribe even just for a dollar a month. Failing that, subscribe to the YouTube channel and share the videos on social media, on, on Facebook groups, on Twitter. You know, get the word out there. And I hope you've just enjoyed this list in you know general as well as the other videos on this channel. So I'm going to sign off and... Uh, dim the lights even more considering I'm going to fix that rotten light but uh, regardless of how many players you want to play the game with two three four five six as long as you remember it's only a game take care and I'll see you next time